Can we start? Yes, so if I introduce Tony first. Okay. All right, uh, my name's Tony Storey. I'm a senior lecturer at Northumbria Law School. Been there 26 years coming up. Uh, I teach criminal law to our first year students and a module called sports law to our third year students. And I'm the program leader for something called the Graduate Diploma in Law, uh, which is a one year program for anyone who's done a degree in anything but law. And they can then convert their, say, English or history degree uh, into a legal qualification. Basically it, I guess. Yeah, there was lots of questions around that about um, sort of getting into law if you haven't done a law degree or a law okay. level, but we'll get on to that. Um, yep. Martin? Hi, I'm Martin. Um, I'm a magistrate. I've been a magistrate for over 20 years. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, uh, magistrates don't get paid and they are volunteers. Uh, I know absolutely nothing about the law uh, because I rely on people uh, in the court, the prosecutor, the defence uh, solicitor and the legal advisor in the court. What I do is make a decision based on what is heard in the court. And that's myself and my two colleagues. We sit as a bench of three people in the court uh, and we make decisions. We're just normal people. Um, I used to be a teacher. Um, I must have been a really, really bad to because I taught Mr. Henson. Um, but uh, that's it. Anybody can be a magistrate, really, if you're between age 18 and 70. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, uh, there will be some questions coming up in a moment. Fabulous. So if we can go to question number one, um, obviously, Martin, you alluded to there the fact that you've had no sort of legal experience or law training or law degree or anything. Um, there's lots of people asking whether or not that it's a requirement to do A-level law before you go on to do a degree at law. They've heard that some universities perhaps don't like you doing A-level law because you come with sort of preconceived ideas about it or sort of misinformation, if you would. Um, but Tony, do you recommend that? A-level law is a good start before doing a law degree, or can you get around it without doing it? Well, um, if, if we get that question about is it a requirement, uh, the answer is definitely no. Um, I'm not aware of any British law school that makes it a requirement. Um, whether it's recommended, that's a different question entirely. Now, at Northumbria, we take a completely neutral policy. So we look for the grades from whatever um, subject students have done at A-level. So we don't require A-level law. Uh, we certainly don't um, distinguish between it and, and other subjects. It's all about the grades. Um, I would guess about a third, maybe a half of our intake have done law. Uh, obviously the others haven't. Um, so when we kick off, and I, my module my criminal law module is one of the very first subjects that students do. It's, it's taught in semester one of year one. Uh, and I always say in my very first lecture that we assume zero knowledge. So I say to the students, if you have done a lawyer level or some other legal qualification, that's going to help you probably, um, I think. But um, we're not going to assume anyone has any prior knowledge. So if you're studying law for the very first time, if you're in week one of year one, then uh, we're not going to expect you to have studied law at all and we'll we'll take it from there. Um, so I think it probably does help a little bit, um, maybe in the first year. So I, I guess people will typically be doing English legal system and either criminal law or taught if, if they're studying law at A level. Um, but I mean, there's lots of other subjects that students will be studying. Uh, contract law is the typical first year module and then when you get to second year you're doing things like land law no one's going to have studied them at, at a level so it, i think it might give you a little short-term uh, boost because there'll, there'll be some revision uh, in your first year of your law degree but um, you, you'll quickly find that within a few months and certainly by the time you get a second year um, everything will be completely new and i think one there is a potential downside as well if you have to, I mean, Daryl, you mentioned there, students might come in with preconceived ideas. I don't think that's a problem particularly. I think what might be a problem is complacency, actually. I think if students have done law at A-level and they'll turn up, and certainly in my lectures, 
uh, where they've done criminal law before, they might be thinking, oh, I've done this, I know this, this is easy. Um, but I deliberately include things on the syllabus that students won't have done at A-level, um, just to, uh, not to try and catch people out, but just to ensure that it's not all stuff they've already done before. So yeah, I would think, yeah, if you can do law, it, it, I think it helps, um, but there's just, God, be, be careful, don't, don't get complacent. Yeah. Don't turn up at university thinking, oh, I've done this, this is gonna be easy. So I, I, mean, I, I was catching up with Martin before we came online and what you were saying there about throwing some curveballs in. I remember one of our first lectures I had with you, introducing R versus Brown and the, the conversations <laughs> right. that eluded from, from that. And that's a completely different conversation for a different oh, day, yes. I think. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. But Martin, Martin, do you think any sort of um, legal training would have given you a better stand in your job? Or do you feel like you've been well equipped without sort of doing legal training? I, I think it's um, uh, any legal training. No, I don't think so, uh, because we can rely on the professionals in the court. Uh, I think the important thing about being a magistrate is is knowing what's going on, perhaps in your own uh, neighbourhood, because that's about what, what it's local justice or supposed to be local justice. Um, so you know your own neighbourhood, you know the people who are living there and what have you. Uh, I think doing something like an A level. Uh, will give you a context of what the law is and perhaps will help you initially with the language of the law. Uh, but um, I'm, learn I'm continuing to learn as I go on all the time and I think it's quite exciting uh, because the law changes and the uh, application of the law changes all the time. It isn't a month go by without, I get, without me getting some sort of information about uh, a different focus on the sentencing guidelines or something, something perhaps to do with uh, mental health or domestic violence or just being able to uh, utilise uh, social media. Um, there's a lot going on. Oh. I mean, Tony, you mentioned there that there were sort of your English degrees and your sort of your history degrees that people can transfer from. Are you looking for when people come on to do law, sort of like your written subjects for all the sort of the, the reading that you have to do and sort of the academic studying that you have to do and the reports you have to write. Is it, are you looking for people who have got sort of that sort of background in A-levels, sort of the standard that you require? Well, um, you know, as I was saying, at Northumbria, I can't speak for other law schools, but at Northumbria, um, we will take um, any uh, combination of A-level subjects. So as I say, if someone has done law, uh, that's fine. But equally, if someone hasn't, it, it won't uh, make any any difference to them because I say we assume zero knowledge base. I would say that um, if you are seriously considering doing law at degree level, uh, then if you have done something like English literature or history, uh, I mean, I did English literature at a A-level student 30 plus years ago now, but. Uh, that definitely helped um, studying law. You might not think there's an obvious connection there between uh, English literature and, and law, but law does revolve around law um, made either by Parliament, so Acts of Parliament, or judgments of the courts, uh, some of which are very lengthy. Um, so if you're going to study law properly and take it really you know, seriously, uh, then you're going to be doing a lot of reading and you're going to be working at kind of reading between the lines as well looking for um subtleties in the judgments looking for maybe inconsistencies things left unsaid all the sort of things that you'll do if you're studying either history or, or english literature li english literature in particular i think is a really good one yeah um because i say this to my degree students as well that you know when you're reading a judgment and you, you're kind of picking it apart and looking for inconsistencies and ambiguities and you're doing that when you're reading legislation as well acts of parliament you're always looking to see if there's some loopholes that can be exploited all the sort of things you'll learn when you're reading um, you know shakespearean plays or chaucer's poems or dickens novels or whatever it's exactly the same skills believe it or not so that's a really good one and history as well because i mean you're going to be reading a lot of uh, uh, documents and, and again looking for lessons to be learned for the future and that's again a skill that you can use as a law student um, you, you might be reading a case from last week or you might be reading a case from 300 years ago so you're always looking to see what was the historical social economic political context and what lessons can we learn from that so those history and English particularly useful but I mean if a student turned up having 
done maths, physics, and chemistry at A level, then they, they, they would be um, treated exactly the same as everyone else yeah. uh, when it when it comes to en enrolling on the on the degree. That's, I mean, I, I I did A level law and I did A level English language, and I remember sort of rolling up in the first week, getting the textbook list going to the library, mm -hmm. getting the textbooks and coming out with a pile of books that were like that. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, read, I read all the time and that, that was still sort of, not daunting, but it was a sort of an eye opener on how much you had to do. And I think if we're, if we're looking from a pupil standpoint, like you mentioned the, the English and history, there's lots of now at GCSE, there's all of the skills, the inference skills, the sort of the ambiguity, as you said, the sort of um, the finer details to points of what people are saying or what people are writing about context. They're, they're well prepared for that at GCSE now, so I think you know we are building it up. So um, yeah, if if we move to you, Martin, there's a question coming here saying, do you ever come away from a trial and think about the people who are involved? Like, do you ever feel guilty about sending someone to to prison, or do you ever come away and think there was a nagging doubt that there wasn't enough evidence in the trial to convict someone, even if you have found them not guilty? Um, is I, I guess the question is, do you ever come away feeling frustrated? I, I do come, come away feeling frustrated uh, as well, but I've never come away thinking that a mistake has been made. Um, although sometimes I may disagree with the verdict, but um, as Magistrate, he said it was a bench of three. So if two people agree and one person doesn't agree about the verdict, then it goes with the two people. Uh, and in court, we don't say who voted for what. It's just the presiding justice who will um, then uh, uh, tell the defendant what the score is. Um, my frustration, and it's why I became a magistrate, uh, um, is that uh, I get very, very annoyed when people, uh, in the, in the, in the, if I go back a little bit, some of your students will watch uh, programs like uh, police interceptors and traffic cops and things like that. And when you watch stuff like that and you see the mayhem that some people cause and the way that they treat police officers and members of the public and then at the end the commentator will say and uh, at the end of the day there was uh, the cps didn't press charges or they got a fine or something like that uh, members of the public must get really, really frustrated well over 20 years ago i was reading the local mail i was getting frustrated uh reading that people were doing all sorts of nasty things and not going to prison so I thought, well, I'm going to see what the hell goes on here. And I walked up to court and I sat in the back of the magistrate's court uh, to see exactly what would go on. And as we went through the day, I got more and more frustrated. And when the court day was over, I sat there and I was, I was really quite livid. And the chairman of the bench, before he went out, said, sir, you've been there for some time. Can I just ask you what you're doing? And I said, yeah, I've just come to see justice being served in Hartlepool and I said oh, and I'm really frustrated and he said yeah and see the point I said well why don't these people why haven't you sent these people to prison and he said well we get frustrated as well but there's one thing that's stopping us doing that and I was like, really quite positive like well what is it then he said well it's the law uh, and it's absolutely correct because the law will say what you can and you cannot do when people commit certain crimes and the public doesn't really know that. And as a result of that, I became a magistrate and I still get frustrated. And I get frustrated because um, there's a burden of proof. And in a criminal case, it's beyond reasonable doubt, or as we now have to say, just make sure that you know. Uh, and if the Crown Prosecution Service uh, cannot prove without beyond reasonable, reasonable doubt, then the defendant will walk free. And there are a number of times when myself and my colleagues are absolutely certain, I know and are sure that the defendant committed the crime. However, the Crown Prosecution Service did not prove it. That's frustrating. That person we know is guilty, it has to be proved to be guilty. And if there's not the evidence and the evidence isn't presented properly, then that's it. And I think, uh, perhaps as Tony was saying there as well, it's about reading, it's about having a language, it's about being articulate, it's about knowing what to say, it's about being 
accurate in the detail so that you can prove beyond reasonable doubt if you're a prosecutor or with that detail and accuracy to make a doubt if you are the defense solicitor and yeah i'm frustrated sometimes when i know people are guilty but it's not proved beyond reasonable doubt um but that's justice and that's how it should be because otherwise uh if you don't if you don't like somebody you say, oh well we'll send it to prison Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes yeah. a big, a big talking point in uh, the retiring room. When we've heard all the evidence, um, we really have to focus hard on this is what we've heard. Although we believe the guy's guilty or the person's guilty, sorry, but this is what we've heard. Has it been proved beyond a reasonable doubt? And uh, sometimes it isn't. And on that, Tony, would you ever want to become a magistrate based on <laughs> Martin's frustration? <laughs> It's, it's, um, it's not something I've seriously thought about, to be quite honest. I mean, one of my colleagues is a magistrate, so it is something you can do um, whilst working in a law school. They're, they're not mutually uh, incompatible uh, professions, I guess. Um, I don't know, uh, possibly later on in, in life, I guess. Um, but um, I've got more than enough to keep me busy at the moment. So, yeah, so maybe imagine. in the future. I had a question this morning, Martin, um, I didn't include it on the agenda, but they said, are you ever scared to go out after you've sort of sentenced somebody to prison and then their family's there? Are you, obviously, you, you're talk, talking about local crimes and local areas and sitting in the yeah. local magistrate's yeah. court. Are you ever, ever worried about sort of bumping into these people at late at night? Well, no, um, I'm not. I think as a uh, member of the public, you stick your head above the parapet and, uh, and that's it. I often walk around uh, the, the town or my estate and uh, somebody will look at me and think, and I know them, and they'll think, I know you from somewhere. Mm -hmm. But they see me in my suit and my tie, they don't see me in my t-shirt and my shorts. I have a clue, they think, I know you, but where do I know you from? But then sometimes it would be, how are you doing, sir? How are you, sir? You know, uh, um, there is, a certain amount of respect uh, from people because the bench, I would hope, is, is very, very fair. Um, and most of the naughty boys and naughty girls know they've been wrong. Uh, yeah. They know they've been wrong. And it's not everybody, of course. It's a very small minority of, uh, of the population, but it's the same minority. So in communities everybody knows who the naughty boys and naughty girls are and uh, sometimes they go out of it you know sometimes they don't uh, i mean your, your workload must be sort of through the roof because you know I, I spoke to this about my pupils sort of when we did sort of the criminal element of, of our module about how many cases you actually hear because there's only like is it one percent only two percent of cases go to the crown court it's about 95 percent of Cases. Yeah, five percent in the Crown Court, I would say. Yeah, yeah. about five percent go to Crown Court. Ninety-five percent of cases are completed in the Magistrates Court. Um, I sit two or perhaps twice a week for a whole day in perhaps a remand court or a trial or um, different courts. But um, we can have as many as thirty different cases in a day. Um, and uh, in Teesside, there could be five courts running. So it's very, very busy. But the challenging, the serious cases, they all go to the Crown Court. If somebody, in the, if somebody in the Magistrates Court doesn't like the, uh, the uh, result, i.e. they're convicted, and they don't like that, or the sentence, and they don't like the sentence, they obviously then have a right of appeal to the Crown Court. And they can go in front of the judge and just say, well, Look, I don't like that, and it will all start again. So there's a question that's coming up next about how to become a magistrate, but then on the back of that, how how do you go about being a judge? So I guess magistrate for Tony, uh, magistrate for Martin, and then how to be a judge to Tony. Well, how you anybody who's anybody who's between the age of eighteen and uh, seventy can be a magistrate, um, although. Uh, it's very difficult if you're a young person and you've got a job because you need your employer to be able to give you time off during the day and that sometimes is very very difficult 
the sad thing is, is that the average age of the bench in Cleveland is 58, 59 years old. And at the moment, we're trying to, to recruit more magistrates who are younger. The other sad thing is that uh, the bench is predominantly white and uh, we need more uh, ethnic minorities in uh, uh, to, for a balance, uh, especially in the Middlesbrough area. Um, the balance in the, in, the, in the bench is probably about 50-50 male, female, but we're mainly white middle class and that's, doesn't, that's not representative of uh, the population of, uh, of Teesside. Um, once you decide you want to be a magistrate, you'd apply, uh, you go through an application process, you go through uh, quite a rigorous interview process, which is two quite rigorous interviews. And then if you're accepted, um, uh, you get accepted by the Lord Chancellor and then uh, you would go through a training process, which takes at least a year. You can still sit through that process, but you're not um, uh, uh, fully fledged until you've completed uh, a number of appraisals and are signed off by uh, an experienced magistrate. So um, it can take 18 months to two years from application to the finish of the process. Well, on the back of that, Tony, is there a requirement to be a magistrate before you're a judge, or is it just the experience oh, of legal? Um, well, it must admit, this is a subject I used to teach, but uh, haven't taught for more than 10, could be 15 years now. So um, this wasn't on one of your list of questions, so I haven't brushed up on, on this. So I'm not, just, just bear with me on if I'm not 100% accurate or 100% up to date on this one, but certainly. Um, what Martin was saying there about having to apply and going through an interview process and and, um, uh, and eventually being appointed is broadly the same with with the judiciary. A uh, big difference um, is that whereas magistrates don't have to have legal qualifications, judges do. So um, certainly when I was teaching this uh, subject area, there was a requirement that you had to be a qualified solicitor or barrister, and I'd be surprised if that's changed. Yeah. Um, now, you would typically start um, with a part-time judicial role, and I know a couple of my colleagues have actually um, taken on uh, roles recently working for tribunals. Um, so there's a couple of my colleagues working as, as tribunal judges, but there's another colleague of mine who's working as a part-time uh, district judge. Um, so they're combining those part-time judicial offices with uh, their teaching commitments. Um, my understanding is once you've gotten into the judiciary on a part-time basis and if you want to make it full-time you apply to become full-time and you work your way up from there I suppose ultimately you work your way up and become a high court judge and then uh, then the court of appeal will be next and then ultimately um, you get a, get a position with the, uh, the UK Supreme Court that would be the way to, to work it now there are various exceptions to that I know that some people have been appointed directly to the High Court or directly to the Court of Appeal. I think there's even one judge, I think I'm right in saying this, who was appointed directly to the UK Supreme Court. I'd have to check that. Um, but most student, uh, judges start off at the lower end as district or circuit judges and work their way up. But um, un unless my knowledge is completely out of date, there is a requirement that you not only have legal qualifications, but you've actually been a solicitor or barrister first, and then you work your way up from there and there's a body called the judicial appointments commission who was set up would that have been must be 20 years ago approximately um and they're they're heavily involved in um uh, well, coming back to what martin was saying there their, their role amongst other things is to diversify the judiciary so i know when i started teaching law north of really with the judiciary being uh, and the phrase was pale male and stale um, so white skinned uh, male and shall we say not not the youngest members of society so uh, that was the perception and the judicial appointments commission was set up um, 20 plus years ago to try and address that and, and certainly the judiciary has diversified there's a far greater proportion of uh, women joining the judiciary i mean the three colleagues that i mentioned who are now judges all all female 
So uh, um, that, that's an insight, I think, into uh, the, the way in which the judiciary is diversifying. And I think it is becoming a, a younger uh, profession as well. But there's, there's still a problem with a, a lack of ethnic minority representation. That, that's definitely true. Good. Um, just, okay. just to clarify about district judges, um, um, a district judge is a, ju is a judge in a magistrate's court. A mm -hmm. district judge uh, sits alone in a magistrate's court but has the same powers as a magistrate. Um, a district judge is qualified uh, and uh, gets paid about 100, £110,000 a year. So it's a canny job. Um, uh, but they sit alone. Now, if you look at Crown Court judges um, and uh, say a trial in a Crown Court, who makes a decision on guilt in a Crown Court? Well, it's not the judge, it's the jury. So the jury makes the decision on guilt in a Crown Court. The judge will uh, direct them and then sentence. Um, in a magistrate's court with a bench, there are three magistrates and uh, they will make a decision in respect of guilt and then sentence. In a magistrate's court with a district judge, the district judge sits by themselves and makes a judicial decision on guilt. So bizarrely, the most powerful judges would seem to be sometimes the district judge because they're the people who just sit by themselves and make decisions. In the Crown Court, uh, the, the part-time judges, I think that uh, Tony was alluding to, uh, I think they're called recorders initially, the junior ones, and they can uh, be solicitors and barristers, uh, become recorders, and they'll sit on a part-time basis. Bizarrely, the chief uh, judge in the Crown Court, say in, in Teesside, is called the recorder of Middlesbrough, so you get a recorder at the bottom end and a recorder at the top end. Um, but from the recorder at the bottom end, part time, you go full, you go full time, and then you work your way up, uh, as Tony was saying. Um, very, very good jobs. I sit in the Crown Court as a magistrate on appeals, and I sit with a judge, and it is absolutely fascinating. The, everyone I've sat with at Teesside has an intellect the size of the moon. They are very, very clever people, very articulate, lovely people, uh, mainly male, all white as in Teesside, uh, uh, but there are a couple of female uh, judges there who are really good, but all very, very good, know exactly what they're talking about, very, very polite. Uh, but, you know, paid for what they do, very, very important job, and very responsible job, but they work very, very hard. So on that, you actually, just actually, that Darryl, just, Darryl, just one thing. Now, now that I'm had an opportunity to think about this, I'm pretty sure that the the, the rules on uh, people becoming judges might have been relaxed in the last year or so. Because I, I recall a conversation with a colleague of mine who who did say that. Uh, I should think about applying for a, a judicial post. And I think, well, I, I said, well, I'm, I've spent 20 plus years teaching law, but I'm not actually a solicitor or barrister. And I'm sure she was saying that's not actually a requirement anymore. So I think legal qualification is still a requirement, but not actually having practice. I'm not, I would have to double check that, but I have a feeling that is one of the relaxations that have been introduced recently uh, to try and further diversify the judiciary so. yeah i mean certainly something for us we can let our pupils sort of go away and research that and come back to us at some point sure <laughs> they can do the donkey work um so you said martin that you know you've sat with judges in in the crown court and obviously tony you've you've taught for 20 odd years and i know we had this conversation the other day about your most memorable case or something that stands out to you. I know we can't go into sort of the finite details, Martin, of the who's and what's, but is, is there a case that sticks in your mind that you, you've remembered in your career? For me, it's one that's quite recent, really. There's been a lot of them. Uh, the frustrating ones when you know somebody's guilty and it hasn't been proved beyond reasonable doubt, they stick in your mind, because I get frustrated with that. There was a health and safety violation uh, where somebody was badly injured uh, a number of years ago and uh, 
we fined the company over a hundred thousand pounds that was memorable uh, you can't do that in magistrates court now but you could at the time but the most recent and it got a bit of publicity a couple of weeks ago was the appeal to the crown court by a man who had spat at a police officer and said uh, i'm going to give you the pro uh, coronavirus here uh, and uh, he appealed against his sentence and i got a telephone call one day from uh, the people who organize uh, the sit-ins and said can you go to teesside crown court and sit on an appeal so I did, and I turned up, and um, I was sitting with the recorder of Middlesbrough there, who's the senior judge. Uh, and it was um, the guy who, who was appealing his sentence, and he was sentenced to six months imprisonment for uh, assaulting an emergency worker, and that assault was a spit. So spitting at somebody is assault. And it's serious if it's an emergency worker. It used to be assault PC, police constable, but there are a lot of other emergency workers now, so it's now the sort of emergency worker. And he got six months for screaming and shouting that he was going to pass on the virus and spat at this police officer. He also hit another police officer and got four months for that. Uh, uh, so it was uh, making ten months in total. Um, he appealed against it because uh, He'd shown a lot of remorse. There were no similar offences in his uh, history. He hadn't offended for lots and lots of years. And he'd given an early guilty plea. But if you give an early guilty plea, the guidelines would say that, you, that the sent, whoever's sentencing must give credit for that guilty plea. And it's usually a third off the sentence. So he didn't get the credit for the guilty plea because it shouldn't have been six months it should have been four months and it shouldn't have been four months it should have been three months theoretically but and i can only presume it must have been a district judge uh was i believe uh, absolutely correct in saying well look this was a really very very serious offense in very very challenging times and the public and the emergency services must be protected here. So this whole thing was done uh, not live in the court. Uh, the judge and I were in the court. The court associate was there and the usher was there. Uh, everybody else was uh, uh, on Skype uh, from the prison, from the uh, uh, CPS, from uh, the solicitor's office and uh, from the local newspaper as well. So it was still being reported. Uh, uh, it worked well, the technology worked. Uh, uh, but in the end, the judge and I had to have, have a discussion about this. Uh, and the judge was quite clear that he felt, as I did, that the, that the sentence for six months was absolutely correct, given the circumstances. And the sentence for four months was absolutely correct, given the circumstances. However, because there was remorse, because there were no similar offences, because there were no recent offences, and because it was an early guilty plea, what the judge decided to do was to make the four month sentence not consecutive to the six months, but make it concurrent to the six months, making, instead of a 10-month sentence, a six-month sentence. This was reported in the local newspaper, and um, all, I think all hell broke loose. <laughs> I mean, uh, was, was he sentenced for actually carrying the virus, or was it the perceived threat? The threats. The threats. The threats. The threat was that he just, you know, absolutely off his head. Um, uh, but it was out, out of character, theoretically, for this guy to have done what he'd done, because he was just drunk. Um, but um, given the times, it was uh, very, very serious. However, no matter how serious it is, uh, the judge felt that, uh, and I have to agree with him, the judge felt 
that you should still take into consideration the other things that you should normally be taking into consideration. Yeah. So the sentences stayed. There was no change to the sentences at all, except instead of being consecutive, they were concurrent. So he'd still do six months in prison, which means he'd serve three. I mean, on on a teaching standpoint, Tony, if he was carrying the virus there and he spat someone and infected someone, would that sort of aggravate the offence a little bit? Well, I mean, we have a we had a debate about this, um, obviously the online. Um, about a week ago, there was a, a case where um, a British transport worker yeah. um, has a, has died very sadly, um, but there's been an allegation made that somebody. And I believe the police have not arrested him, but have been interviewing somebody. Somebody apparently coughed in her face and also coughed in the face of a colleague um, and indicated that he had the virus and he was trying to infect her with it. And, and uh, as we know, she subsequently died. And we were just debating amongst my colleagues and myself what possible crimes that would be. And uh, we were discussing the possibility of murder as being the most extreme. Uh, well, the most serious offence, I should say. But the, the problem with murder and also manslaughter on these facts is you have to prove that the death was caused by the defendant. Now, proving a causal connection, given that the, there's the, every possibility that the, the victim here could have infect, been infected by someone else or by simply touching a, a surface. I think a, a, a half-decent defence lawyer would, would easily be able to say, well, there's no chance of proving beyond reasonable doubt that it was this defendant who infected this victim. So we were exploring other possibilities. Um, there's an attempted murder we considered, but that requires proof. And as Martin was saying earlier on, it has to be proof beyond reasonable doubt. Um, attempted murder requires proof of intent to kill. We thought that's going to be difficult to prove. So I think what we eventually came up with um, is if this man is ever charged, and goes to court, then uh, what we think is it would be an attempting grievous bodily harm with intent. That's what we're going for, uh, which is a very serious offence, but that it avoids the causation problem because you don't have to prove that the virus was actually transmitted from the defendant to the victim. You just have to prove that the defendant intended to um, infect the victim with the virus. So if, if the evidence emerges that he did have the virus, um, or even if he didn't but thought he did, and his intent was to transmit it to her by coughing in her face, then we think there's a pretty good chance of a conviction there, and that's a very serious offence. Absolutely, that sounds, sounds about right, I think. So I think what, watch this space. The last I heard is that someone had been identified as being the perpetrator and was being interviewed under police caution. That's the last I heard. Fair, I mean, aside from that, Tony, do you have a sort of memorable or I know you've got seen several cases in your time <laughs> yeah well this was, I think that when you sent that list of questions over this was probably the hardest one yeah. to be honest um, I have narrowed it down eventually to one and um, funny enough it, it, some overlap with what Martin was saying because there's a case um, where, where the defendant was not drunk but high on drugs it's a case called uh, the Crown and Lipman from the late 1960s Daryl you'll nodding in yeah. recognition so uh the, the, the case was a uh, very much of its time it was the late 1960s september 1967 to be exact an american national who's holidaying in london called bobby lipman and uh, the story goes that he meets a, a young french uh woman called claudie del bar um in a nightclub and they go back to her flat in chelsea uh, and what happens next, only Bobby knows for certain. Um, his version of events is that the pair of them took LSD, so a powerful psychedelic drug. He then remembers nothing until waking up several hours later. Tragically, Claudia is dead. He's strangled and or suffocated her with the bedclothes. The next thing he does is leg it out of the flat, uh, head off to his hotel, grab his belongings, stuff them into a suitcase, jumps on a plane out of Heathrow and, and, and hightails it off to America. Claudie's body is then found about three days later. The, obviously, the, there's a murder investigation launch. Scotland Yard are involved. It takes a long time before they eventually track down Bobby Lippman as their prime suspect. 
he's now in America. He has to be extradited back to the United Kingdom, which he resists, but eventually he's brought back to the UK and he's faces it. He faces a murder trial at the Old Bailey in central London. And he pleads not guilty on the basis that he lacks the mental element of the offence. I don't know whether your students have had a look yeah, at Yeah, we've touched upon the start of the men's race. Okay, we touched upon this, raising. right. Yeah. So, so murder requires proof of malice of forethought, and that means intent to kill another human being or intent to do grievous bodily harm to another human being. Now, what Bobby says is that whilst he was in this uh, LSD-induced state, he was uh, having a, a bad acid trip. And he says that he was somehow sucked down into the centre of the earth, which opened up, uh, and there he was embroiled in a fight with gigantic fire-breathing snakes. And in, in fighting them off and in saving his own life, he in inadvertently uh, uh, killed poor Claudie. Um, and the jury accepted that. So he was found not guilty of murder, but found guilty of manslaughter instead, on the basis that he didn't have the, the mental element required of of murder. Uh, he appealed um, his conviction to the Court of Appeal, but uh, the Court of Appeal confirmed that if you kill somebody whilst in a drug or drink induced state, uh, then at the very least you're looking at manslaughter, if not murder. So there you go, uh, the case of Bobby Lippmann, that's possibly the most memorable of every yeah. case I've ever come across. Sounds like some of my uh, people's defences sometimes. <laughs> You know, I couldn't do it because of this or that. Or... <laughs> I mean, if, if any of them go ahead and use that device about being stuck to the centre of the earth, forget it. Um, right, if we move on, uh, question to you, Tony, about mm -hmm. getting into sort of law work, about the law being oversaturated. About, mm. I mean, how many pupils do you get sort of each year as into university? Oh, right. Uh, well, our, our intake is about 400. And in Northumbria, we run uh, two law degrees in parallel with each other. So there's a three-year law degree, uh, the LLB, which is very similar to what just about every other law school in the country runs. We also run a four-year programme, um, which takes, obviously, the students a, a stage further. They get a master's degree at the end of it, but more importantly, it exempts them from having to do either the legal practice course or the bar professional training course afterwards. Uh, so that students who graduate from our four-year program um, can go straight into a training contract with a law firm uh, or a pupillage with a set of barristers chambers. Um, whereas the students who are doing the law degree don't necessarily want to go into legal practice, but uh, they're interested in the study of law itself. And the way it works, students can transfer from one program to the other. So if a student starts on the four-year program and decides after 18 months or so, or a couple of years, that maybe working as a lawyer is not really for them they can switch to the three-year route but the, the reverse is true as well so a student who starts on the three-year route and maybe they just want to keep their options open at the beginning then thinks you know I really really like this I can see myself doing this as a career they can then switch to the four-year program um, the students who stay on the three-year program they can go off and, and do you know anything um, I suppose uh, I've noticed a lot of students going into teaching um, funny enough so um, at, at all sorts of different levels. I mean, I know former students who are now primary school teachers. Uh, plenty of my former students are, are teaching uh, uh, in high schools or, or in colleges. So teaching is a, is a popular destination for our LLB graduates. But those students that, that complete the four-year programme, then I would say a very high proportion um, do go into legal practice. Um, whether it's uh, with a firm of solicitors, which is obviously where most lawyers are employed, or, or as barristers. And, and the Crown Prosecution Service, I've noticed, quite a lot of our graduates are, are working for the CPS now. So it's, it's yeah, lawyers, you know, it's a broad, it's not just a single profession, it, it's, it breaks up into lots of um, you know, smaller professions. So we have high street firms um, where the students are maybe advising on property disputes or helping um, people resolve matrimonial problems or divorces um, or people dealing with employment disputes, that sort of thing, right up to I don't know, you know, former students of mine who are working for you know, big corporate law firms um, in Newcastle or 
further afield in Leeds or London or in New York. I've, I've saw a post on, there's a website called LinkedIn. I don't know whether any of your students are attached to it, but I encourage all of our students to get involved in it. It's a kind of professional social networking site. And I saw just a couple of days ago, a former student of mine has um, just passed the New York bar exam. So she's going to be a lawyer in, in New York City. Um, but that, you know, so uh, I was saying, Lots of students are now barristers. A former student of mine graduated just last year. She's starting a, a pupillage down in London. Um, uh, and I say the Crown Prosecution Service are taking on quite a few of our former students. So I think they, I, I wouldn't say the market is saturated because you can use a law degree um, in all sorts of different ways and you can export it. So, you know, you can work in all sorts of other countries. So there you go. That takes you around the world. I mean, Martin, you, you, you touched upon sort of why he wanted to be um, a magistrate, but did you ever think about doing sort of any legal training before that? Or whilst you've been a magistrate, if you wanted to take up legal training? Um, I don't know. I've, I've, been, I've been a teacher all my life. Um, and uh, if somebody said to me, if you hadn't been a teacher, what would you have been? And I would have said, well, before I get to know people in the legal profession, it would be something that if I'd had the brain to do it and had the information, I think I would really have liked to have uh, gone that way. I've got a huge respect for uh, uh, all advocates, but especially judges as well. They're just uh, uh, amazing people with uh, uh, very, very responsible for jobs. Uh, I don't think I could have done it, but uh, um, interesting, interesting. But I do enjoy uh, being a magistrate, although uh, I have to leave next year. Uh, it, that's a bit of a shame as well, because you have to uh, have to get in when you're 70, and I just feel as though I'm, I'm getting into my stride now. Um, but it is, it is what it is. And same question to you, Tony. What, what what made you sort of take up a career? Well, that is, that is a good question. Um, I must admit, when I left uh, when I left college, um, doing a law degree is not something that had occurred to me at the time. And um, I actually went off to university to do an English literature degree, having done English literature A level. I was talking about that earlier on, um, and and just never got into that. I didn't enjoy it at all. But um, the university where I went, they, they actually ran uh, law as a subsidiary module in year one. So that was my first exposure. I'd never studied law before, but I had to pick a subsidiary module at, at uni and, and pick law and instantly enjoyed it far more than the main subject that I was supposed to be doing. So um, to cut long story short, I dropped off that course and um, I actually worked for a couple of years while I made a decision about what I was going to do with the rest of my life and I thought I really should give give law a crack so I was actually 21 when I went off to university um, and to start my law degree so three years um, after most uh, students start their uh, uh, degrees so I was 21 and uh, went off to uh, it was Leicester University and just instantly loved it um, but I, I said I'd never thought about law as a career um, even at this point um, but I, I know that most of my fellow students at the time were all um, aspiring solicitors. So I got kind of carried along with that. And, um, and, and I remember between my second and third year, I did apply for training contracts to, to start um, after, after the degree. But then I thought, yeah, really, I'm not convinced that's the right sort of job for me. And the more I researched it, the more I thought, I don't think this is really for me, but what I was thinking is that I really loved being a law student. So eventually I went to see my guidance tutor. And this was about halfway through my final year at university and said, how do I get to do your job? And uh, his advice was, uh, well, finish your law degree, obviously, and then do a, do a master's degree. Um, so I did that. So I graduated from Leicester and then I did a master's degree at Newcastle University. And uh, within a few months of that, um, spotted an advert in the Evening Chronicle when the Evening Chronicle was you know, still uh, widely circulated in paper format 
and uh, I was still living at my mum and dad's house at this point, having recently graduated, not having a huge amount of money. And um, my mum and dad used to get the Evening Chronicle delivered every day. So sure enough, in the job section one day, uh, Northumbria University were advertising uh, for four lecturers to start in, in the autumn. Um, and so I applied and as luck would have it, got one of them and I've been here ever since. So I wouldn't say I've stumbled into legal um, academia, but it was never a career plan. It was a question of going off to university to do something totally different and, and finding law offered as a subsidiary subject and ended up studying that. Um, and then going off to university to study law and ending up deciding not to go and do any of the um, legal professions, but becoming a legal academic. But um, so, OK, there wasn't a grand plan, but it certainly worked out as I'm coming up to 26 years at Northumbria now. And I've um, enjoyed, I, would, I wouldn't say every single minute of it, but I mean, 99 percent of the time I've, I've absolutely loved it. So it's all worked out well in the end. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's some advice in there on saying if you've set out to do something and it's not quite for you, that there is opportunity to change and there is sort of a, a path for you to, to go on and sort of, you know, you're not restricted by the choices that you make at day one. You can sort of alter your course and it, it does work out well for you in the end. Well, yeah, I mean, every, I would, I would guess about once, once a month or so, I get a, an email from a former student who says, uh, um, there, there may well be solicitors by, or barristers by this point, but for some reason then it's it's not the career for them, or it's maybe it's not the career that they thought it was going to be, or, or, or I don't know what, maybe the, the, the opportunities for a promotion aren't there or something like that. Um, so every now and again I'll get an email from a former student saying, how do I do your job? So I'm now the person getting asked that question, whereas nearly 30 years ago I was the person asking the question uh, and the answer is very similar to the answer that I was given um, back in 1992 which was to uh, uh, do a postgrad degree um, so to get into academia if anyone is thinking about that then the advice um, is to do a degree in the subject that you're interested in and then um, go beyond that and, and do at least a master's if not a PhD because that's what Northumbria is asking for now for people joining the staff um, to have not just completed a degree in, in their chosen field, but have at least started on a postgraduate course because the, the emphasis on, on research is huge now. Um, so it's not just a question of, of knowing the subject and being able to teach it. It's uh, you need to demonstrate a, at least an ability to um, uh, conduct research. So that, that's a big, uh, uh, very much a big yeah. deal these days. I mean, we, we had this conversation the other day, didn't we, about, not choosing law because it, you know it, it was easy or because it was less time than sort of any other degree it, it's a case of you've got to be interested because the amount of work that you have to put into it it's not going to come sort of easy to you. you you've got to work for it it's not going to be a free ride um and i think yeah we, we, we need to be aware of the fact that choosing a levels choosing degree choices there is an element of hard work in there it's not going to be given to you for free um but at the same time, if, if it turns out it's not for you, then th there is a lot of, there's no harm in sort of altering your path and changing what you want to do, or what you thought you wanted to do in the first place. Well, yeah, and I was saying earlier on that one of my jobs at Northumbria is to run a programme called the Graduate Diploma in Law. So this is like a one-year conversion course for students with a non-law degree. Um, and it allows them to get in a position that anyone who's done a, a three-year LLB would be in. Um, I mean, having said that, there are massive changes uh, coming down the line for the legal profession. The Solicitors Regulation Authority, the SRA, announced a couple of years ago now that they were going to um, dispense with the legal practice course and replace it with something called the Solicitors Qualification Exam. And that's, that's due to start in a, a year or two's time. The, the, the SRA keep pushing the start date back. Um, but it looks like eventually the legal practice course will disappear and this new Solicitor's Qualification Exam, or the SQE, or SQUE, uh, for short, uh, will replace it. That's designed to be much more flexible. That's, that's the thinking behind it. That's the, the rationale for the, for the reform. Um, and it's to allow people who won't necessarily even have done a law degree um, to, to go into the, uh, this, the legal professions. So it, it is designed to 
coming back to what we were talking about earlier on to kind of diversify the profession and, and open it up to um, uh, a much broader socio-economic um, demographic than has previously yeah. been the case. Yeah. Right, if we move on to our, our final question, um, mm. how has the current COVID-19 pandemic affected your day-to-day -day roles? Martin, if I'll come to you, because you've had lots of time to think about whilst we've had a discussion. Yeah. How, how, how has the courts found sort of the current, um, the pandemic, and how are you overcoming any problems that you are, you are facing? It's had a huge impact. Um, uh, Crown courts have, uh, have, until quite recently, been closed, and uh, uh, apart from demands. Um, there are, I think, four Crown Courts around the country now being open for jury trials because, of course, socially, social distancing for juries, uh, not just uh, whilst listening to the evidence, but also in the jury retiring room, we couldn't do in the normal rooms and the normal courts that we've got. So, in uh, the courts that are open, we're using three courts uh, one for a retiring room, uh, one for witnesses, uh, so that that's on a video link and one for the jury and the judge and what have you. So it's, it's quite uh, a big thing that. In the magistrates court, uh, the district judge judges uh, have been, because they're the paid uh, uh, magistrates, the so district judges have been doing most of the work. But again, uh, lots of, most of it has been cancelled. So it's only been remands when uh, people have uh, offended overnight or something they come in and then they're remanded or they're sent off to wait for a trial or probation later on uh, they've been doing that until quite recently anyway uh, we've just um, i've just got a notice to say i'm sitting next week uh, and uh, the there are going to be trials in the magistrates court now as long as there are no more than three witnesses uh, um, the courts are being mapped out so they can be social distancing for everybody and if not then it's going to be through a video link and what have you. So people are working hard now to get the judicial system back on track. My understanding is that there are 400,000 outstanding cases now uh, so the backlog is going to take years to get through. Uh, it just shows how busy the courts are with a minority of people. Um, and it's going to be really difficult. It will change the way that the judicial system works. It's been changing for a couple of years now. Uh, uh, there's been a lot more use of social media. Uh, in the magistrate's court, there's been a, a single justice procedure where a magistrate, not a district judge, sat, sits by themselves with a legal advisor and uh, uh, deliberates over things like uh, traffic uh, cases where the defendant has pleaded guilty. Uh, ultimately, the I think the magistrate will disappear and it will be an algorithm. You'll get uh, caught for speeding, you will uh, go online, you'll accept that it was you, you'll uh, be told how much the fine is, how much the costs are, and you put your credit card uh, details in and you pay and then you get three points. Um, or how many points of whatever it is. There's going to be a lot going that way. Some of the very basic stuff I think will be done online and all of the single business. Um, because there's just so much to do. The Crown Prosecution Service have, it's all about funding, have found it very difficult recently because uh, there just aren't enough prosecutors. And as Tony was saying, they've just started uh, recruiting now. So fingers crossed, uh, that would be good. Um, but there's a huge uh, backlog um, in the magistrates' court before the virus, before lockdown. We were uh, looking at uh, trials three, four months ahead, booking the trials, uh, which is no good at all, especially if somebody's demanded in custody. Because they're demanded in custody, and by the time they get the trial, uh, they've served the sentence. It, they may get, and what happens if they found not guilty? Um, it's, um, it's a bit of a, a challenge at this moment in time, but it will change the way that the judicial system works in the future. 
people lose thinking hard about making it more effective and more efficient. Um, how that goes, I don't know, but something has to change. I mean, Tony, you'll be in the same sort of position as, as we are doing lots of distance learning and but how, how has it affected your sort of final year students who are doing dissertations or? Uh, well, the dissertations hasn't been too bad because uh, when was the lockdown sort of mid-March? I mean, most students were told they needed to have pretty much done all their research and they should be in the final writing up stages by that point. Um, although normally we would have several um, meetings, face-to-face -face meetings in my office um in in the run-up to uh, submission day which is actually tomorrow funnily enough um but obviously that's not been possible so i've been dealing with a lot of email traffic um but i think dissertations are okay that's not been too bad um we had to make a number of changes to our exams that, that was probably the biggest change we had to make in the short term because obviously we, we would normally be having uh, on the first year of the program 400 students so all, all sitting in in large exam venues on various buildings around the campus but of course that's not possible the campus is on almost total shutdown um, so we've moved a lot of the exams online um, we, we didn't do what the government told um, uh, students in colleges and, and schools to do and, and scrap a levels and gcse's we've we've kept all our exams we've moved them online instead um, so uh, one of the modules that i teach uh, the exam was on Thursday of last week and uh, so we made it available on the university's intranet site and the students logged on and they were given a, a set amount of time which was longer than they would normally have and uh, then they were given a, a deadline by which they had to submit their, their typed up answers so no, no written answers anymore um, and so then I, they're now sitting in a, in a on a corner of the uh, university's intranet site and I can log on and, and mark a few papers um, electronically and I'll be doing that so uh, hopefully all of those students will uh, be able to complete their degrees and they'll graduate they'll, there's not going to be a graduation ceremony which would normally be uh, in about five or six weeks from now so that's not going to happen at least not on time we hope to be able to hold a ceremony maybe in the winter um, so we're looking into that L looking further afield um, the new academic year is due to start for brand new students on the 21st of September and returning students a week later. And the university's vice chancellor issued a statement just a fortnight ago saying that the, the plan was uh, to reopen the campus to students. It's currently shut down for students and staff for that matter. Um, in September. Now, whether that actually happens or not, I guess we will find out, but that is the plan. To be honest, I can't see lectures going ahead though. I mean, the idea that in September, I mean, what's it now, end of May? So in, in four months time, I can't imagine being stood where I normally would be stood in, at the end of September in a big lecture theater with 400 students in it, um, all sitting literally uh, you know, shoulder to shoulder because there's 400 seats in, in the lecture theater. But that's not gonna happen clearly. Um, so, but fortunately uh, over the last few years, we've been recording lectures. As a, as a matter of routine so we have a, a bank of recorded lectures so we'll hopefully be able to use most of those um, so the students will be able to log on online sitting at home in their bedrooms wherever it happened, wherever that would be they can walk, watch a lecture and then as far as seminars and workshops are concerned we might be able to bring in a small number of students um, maybe five or six at a time into a 30 seat seminar room and, and do that um, but it may well be a case of, of sessions not unlike the one we're having right now, where I, I'm sat at home, the students are sat at home, and we're having um, a virtual uh, discussion. So I think that's that's probably going to be the, the, the case. But as I say, optimistically, uh, we are looking to reopen the campus to at least some students, maybe not all at once, um, but at least to some students at least uh, in September. So that's 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 where that's where we're at at the moment. Good. I mean, gentlemen, thank, thank you very much for, for your time today on behalf of me and my pupils. Um, I'm sure they're going to find this riveting and, and it, it, it's, it's a platform for them to get, get their teeth stuck into in September. And those that aren't doing it, you know, like Tony said, if there's no pre requirement to have done law at A level. No. So even if this takes your fancy now, you know, you might want to think about it in two years' time when you start looking at mm -hmm. degrees. Um, 
there's certainly lots of avenues to think about. Absolutely. So I will thank you all and thank you for your time. Well, all right.